All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vishal, Vishal Talwar, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank each one of you for joining us today. We're also live on Facebook, and those who have not been able to log on to the webinar, please do watch us on our Facebook page. Uh, some housekeeping rules that I would like to uh, maybe talk about here. We're expecting it to be a one-hour session, where in the first 30 minutes, uh, we'll have a fireside chat uh, with our speaker today. Post that, we'll open up uh, you know, for questions. Uh, you could possibly put your questions on the Q&A uh, page or in the chat box, and I shall direct them towards our speaker today. This webinar, uh, for those who are familiar, uh, is uh, titled, uh, it's a masterclass titled When Tomorrow Comes. It's an effort from our end to bring industry stalwarts and veterans from different walks of life to discuss their thoughts and how and what kind of tomorrow they are envisaging. This masterclass series aims to reveal stories of speakers who've shown the attitude and growth mindset to recalibrate and change to achieve perfection and success in their lives. All of us have our own way of dealing with changes. These are the changes that occur in all our walks of life. It could be professional, it could be personal, emotional, spiritual, and even physical. Some individuals have earned their fame by dealing victoriously with such changes in their lives, be it an industry leader, musician, dancer, actor, or writer. And of course, if you followed us uh, in the last many weeks on our masterclass, When Tomorrow Comes, you would have seen a lot of people from different walks of life, for different kinds of professions actually talking about change. The rate of change, of course, has increased dramatically today. And of course, we are aware of the kind of context that uh, we're currently living in. To discuss uh, about this today, our speaker for today is an eminent uh, you know, personality, someone who showed the way to a lot of other people. Uh, you know, he's a true blue Indian uh, internet entrepreneur. Mr. Sanjeev Bikchandani, uh, he is the founder of InfoEdge India, the company that owns Nokri.com, India's leading job site. It also owns 99acres.com, jeevansathi.com, and shiksha.com. In addition, uh, he's involved in uh, you know, internet startups such as Zomato, Policy Bazaar, Shop Kirana, Ustra, Gramophone, and Printo, among many others. To give um, you a brief background on him, um, Sanjeev School at St. Columbus School in uh, New Delhi. He studied economics and, uh, at St. Stephen's uh, at Delhi University. Of course, uh, I believe he had also an option to join or, or join the IIT. Uh, but of course, he decided to go in for um, uh, an arts uh, degree as a whole. Uh, he began his working uh, career in advertising with Lintas. Uh, he then went on to I'm Ahmedabad and graduated from there in uh, somewhere in 1989. And there, post uh, uh, graduating from IM, he joined a company which is now known as Glaxo Smith Klein. And he used to manage the brand Holix. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Holix brand. Uh, but at the same time, and something that I've uh, read around him, he was someone who was always trying to question, what is it that he wants to do next? What is the life that he would like to lead? And of course, he then went on to quit his job for entrepreneurship about 18 months later. In 1997, uh, after getting influenced um, by the World Wide Web, um, you know, he uh, launched Nokri.com and transformed itself into an internet company. He did start off with uh, humble beginnings, very modest. Um, you know, I believe um, a, a kind of a course, small quarter above a garage and with, of course, a seed capital of a princely 2,000 rupees. I believe he was also paying rent to his dad for the usage of the space. And of course, as we know, the rest is history. Okay, now InfoEdge employs uh, over 4,000 people. Sanjeev is, of course, active uh, in many respects in many areas in various industry forums. He's a contributor uh, to the entrepreneurship ecosystem, which has become really, really relevant and important, and especially in this day and age. Uh, he has served as the president of the Delhi chapter of TAI, the Indus Entrepreneurs. He's also served as a member of the Global Board of Trustees of TAI itself. Um, you know, apart from many other things, he's, he's involved in uh, you know, philanthropy. Uh, he's a founding trustee of Ashoka University. He's a member of the board of Chintan, a not-for-profit organization that works with waste pickers in Delhi. And there are many other initiatives that he's part of. Uh, he has received various awards, um, including the Ernst & Young uh, Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2008. Right? Welcome, Sanjeev. It's a pleasure having you uh, with us. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start off with a few questions. 
and then maybe we'll uh, you know ask the audience for uh, their perspective. Sure. Thank the you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. My our pleasure. Uh, the first question essentially is: uh, I've heard you say in uh, one of these uh, videos I was looking at and watching, uh, you were talking about. Uh, a question that always kind of haunted you, you know, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Wrestling with this question very, very early. So you, a question that came in, uh, into your maybe head uh, a long time ago, you know, very early into your corporate life um, about wanting to change your circumstance. Did you expect this level of change uh, post your decision to leave the corporate world in a way and launch your own, your own startup? Uh, no, I wasn't. I mean, you know, I did not have a long-term plan ki company, badi banegi, you know, it'll be a huge company. Uh, I was clear I didn't want that life and I wanted independence, freedom to create and who knows, something might happen. So I started off with a spirit of adventure uh, saying, uh, and we have a lot of work. For the first seven years, I drifted and did a whole lot of small stuff. Salary surveys, databases, uh, you know, report writing, teaching, training, uh, you know, if somebody would give me a presentation to make, I'd make it and charge 20,000 rupees, you know, stuff like that, whatever came my way to survive. And in 97, we launched Nokri as uh, after doing 20 small things, uh, you know, uh, uh, seemingly one more small idea. At that time, the internet, there were only 14,000 internet accounts in the country. So it looked like a nifty small idea. We had no idea where the internet would go. We had no idea what would happen to the company. But we simply said, this looks like a good thing. Let's just take jobs from newspapers uh, around the country and just put them on the net and see what happens. And we did that and traffic began to come. And uh, when traffic began to come, uh, you know, people began to apply to those jobs and the, in the covering letters, they would write, I saw your ad on knockery.com. And the HR community began to hear about us from the applications. And then people began to call up and say, you know, I've got five jobs. I've not advertised them in the newspaper. Can I send them to you? And we began to charge them. And so in the first year, we did a revenue of two and a half lakhs. And in the second year, we did revenue of 18 lakhs. And uh, I had never seen anything grow 7x in one year, even of a small base. And I said, no, and 18 lakhs was a reasonable sum of money in 98. You know, it was not a... Tiny, tiny sum of money. It looks, like, it looks like a paltry sum of money today, but at that time it was for a self-funded startup, it was not bad. Right? Uh, and that's where I said, you know what? We may have stumbled upon a big idea by accident. So let's just stop doing everything else. And we are an internet company now. And that's how we started. So, you know, no, I did not have big plans. I did not have a vision. Uh, you know, vision all over time. So, you know, it's not as if, uh, you know, you know uh, I had this grand plan when I started. No. Very inspiring. I think it's really inspiring. Um, and of course, but you, you know, the lesson is that look, look, if you stay on in there, if you hang on in there long enough and keep on trying, uh, you know, sooner or later, something good will happen. Just keep on trying. Don't give up. I think that's a very, very good lesson. I think. So do you think change is actually inevitable, especially with the kind of circumstances? Well, look, change has always been happening. So it's, we're dealing right you know, it always happens, right? But the real issue is what kind of change with what speed uh, you know, is it surgical change? Is it gradual change? Is it, uh, you know, positive change, negative change? You know, and certainly what we are seeing with COVID right now is, uh, look, uh, it's a nice slogan, you know, that, uh, you know, in adversity is opportunity. You know, people say that. But the truth is, if you've lost your job, the truth is, if you're forced to go back to your village, where there's no employment, the truth is, uh, you know, if you're passing out of college right now and uh, placements are uncertain, and if not impossible or difficult, then it's not necessarily a positive change in the short run. And how you deal with it, both mentally and materially, you know, matters a lot. And this is where we have to be mentally strong, each one of us. That look, we know it's uncertain. We know there's a problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's see how best we can cope with it. Right, right, right. So I would imagine um, the right mindset uh, is actually very important to embrace change. You know, could, could you talk a little or reflect a little bit upon what is the right mindset? Because I guess a lot of people have very different perspectives on it. So look, you know, if let's say there's a student who's doing an MBA uh, mm -hmm. and you know, you are a dean of a school of management. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so your students, right? Now when they joined, they may have had expectations that I'll get this kind of job in this kind of company and this is what will happen. But you know, what is happening right now is a lot of companies have frozen hiring, some are downsizing. Uh, many people are still working from home. It's very hard to induct new joinees working from home. Uh, some, I'm pretty sure some of our summer are also cancelled, right? 
uh, we have seen that in, in business school after business school that people are canceling summer trainings, people are withdrawing offers made. Now, these are difficult times. And certainly for somebody starting off in his or her career, it's unexpected. It's a rude shock, but it's mm -hmm. there. And it's not as if, uh, you know, and it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a stroke of really bad luck, mm -hmm. but it's, but it's real. Right now we have to cope with it. Uh, so mentally, I would say, listen, how do I, if I don't have a job, how do I add value to myself in the next one year? Sure. So that when this blows over, and it will blow over, right? when this blows over, I am in a good position to take advantage of opportunities then. True, true. So, I mean, um, personally, if, if, we, if we talk about you over a period of time, how have you dealt with change, maybe at a personal and a professional level? I think uh, if you become an entrepreneur, uh, you get used to uncertainty and change. For the first two years, I was paralyzed with fear, you know. So I'm from a middle class background. My father was a doctor at the government. Mom was a homemaker, right? And there was nobody in business in, in my family. My, my sister's elder, I'm the youngest in the family. Uh, sister was in government. Uh, brother's a professor uh, in a management school in the US, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, you know, it, it was kind of reasonably set life, right? You get a salary every month, you go to office. And I had done that for five years, right? Three years in Lintas and two years in HMM, right? And, uh, but, I, you know, so, but if you want to do something different, then you probably will have to face some uncertainty, ups and downs. And for the first two years, I was paralyzed with fear. And, I, and my, my fear was, uh, what if I don't have a salary at the end of the month? And if, what if I don't have it for six months? Right? It's not as if there was any family money, right? Uh, the, the family circumstances were decent, but not, uh, uh, you know, uh, not something you could, you could bank upon to, you know, parents to bank hold you forever, right? Uh, so I found my ways to mitigate risk. I think all of us should find ways to mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. And one way I found was that I began to teach at business schools around, in and around Delhi as a visiting faculty on weekends. Right. And that gave me an anchor to sort of, uh, you know, uh, financially, intellectually, something I know is happening every week while I was exploring and other options and drifting on weekdays. So, right. you know, we must find a ways. We, must, we all have to find ways to cope. We all have to find a way. I, I agree. I think, um, I think in your case, um, you did teaching assignments. You were also a consulting editor, um, you know, somewhere just to be able to ensure that, you know, things were, um, you know, in control from a financial perspective. Correct. And um, I believe, um, you know, I, I was watching something and you mentioned that we become prisoners of our visiting cards and our EMIs in a way. We, we, we get into this whole uh, uh, scenario that you talked about, the salary piece, you know, will I be getting a salary? Will I be getting a certain, you know, constant source of income? And I guess as an entrepreneur, that level of uncertainty is something that you get kind of used to. Um, Certainly, I mean, if you're not funded, right? And, uh, you know, when I started out, uh, there was no venture capital in India. You know, you did it with whatever money you could put together, cobble together. And then uh, hopefully you got some money from the customer. You got paying customers, then you were in business. And in a way, that was good discipline. You know, you did have the luxury of spending somebody else's money uh, and uh, expensive ads and uh, you're getting a salary. Uh, it, you had to do it to, by producing a product or a service, uh, which customers will pay for. And when they paid you, uh, you ate. You know, if you, they didn't pay, you didn't eat. True, true. I mean, if, if you look at the current employment space, obviously it's been impo impacted a lot, as you've talked about. There are a lot of conversations around, uh, you know, what's going to happen post-COVID. Will it be a V-shaped recovery, a W-shaped recovery, or a U-shaped recovery? And of course, at times, it's also become a question of survival. Um, you know, business is kind of coming back. Um, but what do you think will change at the workplace? Are there some permanent changes that you were actually seeing, things that we will not go back to even so, after recovery? So I think, uh, I think people's perceptions of risk, organizations' perceptions of risk, I think understanding risk, uh, you know, pr predicting risk, managing risk, I think that will go a perma undergo permanent change. Mm -hmm. right? uh, six months ago, it was, I went to bed, nobody, no company, in its, no CEO in his wildest dreams imagined there could be a global pandemic of this nature, which could shut the world. 
and certainly not India, right? Uh, and so, in all your risk planning, risk assessment, uh, you know, nobody ever ever dreamt of that. Now, in our case, uh, you know, because we had boots, run a bootstrap company for ten years, right? Uh, you know, we were always felt that it's useful to have enough cash in the balance sheet so that even if you get zero collection for a year or two, you can you can continue to run. Now, it was not a formal risk assessment. It was not, uh, you know, and if we had done a formal risk assessment, everybody would say you got too much cash, right? Uh, but it was slight paranoia on our part, stemming from the roots of the company for the first 10 years we were bootstrapped, that we said cash and bank is good. And a lot of it is even better. High gross margins are good. Negative working capital is good. Collecting money in advance is good, right? So financially, that way we have been very conservative, and now in a situation like this, it's, it's sort of holding our company in good stead. Because today, you know, when the moment the lockdown was announced, or maybe one week before that, you know, when we could see it coming that globally people are shutting down, right? We sort of concluded, you know, we we did a we did, our CFO did a, some planning, and we figured that listen, if we cut marketing expenditure to zero. And then there are zero collections for the next three years. We can survive for three years without sacking anybody, without without cutting any salaries. Right? And we felt, therefore, we had a very strong position to our existence is not threatened. And then we can come back. So I think the difference between a, a very good a great entrepreneur in the long run or a great company in the long run uh, and a not so great company is how they manage risk, how they understand risk. And the problem is that. All conventional paradigms, all thinking, all discourse, whether in the media or in management schools, is more around return and less around risk. I think so, very, very... I, I think, I think so, so. So permanent change. I think people's understanding, comprehension of risk will change. Right. And how they plan for it will change. Now, having said that, you know, people have said, you know, work from home will be there forever. You know, I think. Look, it depends. Now, let's say if COVID were to go away or to be managed within the next three to six months, which means you get a cure, you get a vaccine, you you know you flatten the curve, you get herd immunity, uh, you discover that the, the virus is not as fatal in India as it has been overseas, right? Uh, you understand the disease better, your doctors are better able to fix it. If that happens in three to six months, very little will change in terms of it will be back to normal. Right. right. On the other hand, if COVID is a serious threat for three years, then many things will change. So it's I can't predict right now what you know uh, beyond that, but it depends on how quickly we tackle COVID. True. True. I agree. I think. Uh... Um, of course, uh, you know there are some uh, indications that suggest that you know the viral load is varying or maybe you know uh, lesser in comparison to the early stages of COVID in you know the rest of the world. So I course, also under believe that uh, my understanding is that the doctors are now understanding the disease better. Therefore, they're able to uh, do stuff they were not doing earlier. Right. Right. Uh, which uh, because of this improved understanding. It does not mean that it's cured or it's fixed, but you know, uh, it's it's being managed better true, true, true. than it was in say February, Jan. Mm -hmm. So, if you talk about uh, new graduates, uh, if you talk about uh, you know people who are passing out uh, now or in the next one or two years, um, what should they be doing? You know, what should they be expecting? What should they be reinforcing in themselves uh, going forward? So look, if you get a, if you get a job or a salary, great. If you don't, you know, do a course, do an online course, add value, or even work for free, work as an intern, work from home for free, but experience adds value. Second is try and acquire some specialist knowledge or some specialist skill. Find a niche right. for yourself. Right. I don't know what it could be. It's different for different people. Mm -hmm. But look, a generalist skill like sales, 
or a generalist skills like marketing, you know, will not cut it in the next six months, nine months, 12 months. But if you say I'm a specialist in digital marketing and I write really good ads for you know, Google AdWords, which get a higher response and is measurable. That's a value problem. So see right now what happens is we train students, right? And even if you say that, you know, he's a he's specialized in market, specialized in finance, the truth is in management schools, you don't really specialize, right? You are actually specialized on the job because the job at the workplace is very different from what is taught in business schools. And until you do the job on the job and you work up a function or a department, you're not really a specialist. So the question is, can you acquire some specialist knowledge without going to the workplace? And if so, in what area? And that specialist knowledge should be useful. So one, so develop a finely, narrowly focused talent. Second, find a market for that talent. Or work backwards. What talent is there a market for that I can acquire? And make myself useful to the organization. And if you have to work for free, work for free right now, get that work X on your CV. Right, right. Now, these are harsh words. You are probably expecting a great job and a great salary. And if you get it, fantastic. But if you don't, don't, don't mourn, get to work. And I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, five years, seven years, 10 years from now, you look back at this six, nine month period as great learning, great experience, as a, as a badge of honor that I came through that. Very good advice. I think. Uh... No, I, mean, I mean, it's like this, yeah. See, uh, the, the World War II veterans, the survivors, I mean, for decades, look back on it as a badge of honor. You know, I came through that. I fought Hitler. Right? Uh, you will be a COVID survivor. And you came through this. You have been, you know, uh, what is that Hindi uh, saying? Sone ko khare hone ke liye aag se nikalna padta hai? Something on those lines, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, right? I don't know the exact words. Yeah. So this is, this is the aag, this is the fire. True. Absolutely agree. So do, do you reckon um, uh, there'll be more transition and movement towards uh, self-employment and entrepreneurship? Uh, given uh, the conditions. There will be, there will be, but you see the, the thing about entrepreneurship is you've got to understand is that it's Darwinian, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 100 try, one succeed. Okay. Uh, and the one that succeeds and makes it big could become really big and create a lot of value. Right? So you must try, but think it through, execute well. Right? And mm -hmm. You may not succeed, big, but make sure you don't fail at least. You, you know, are surviving, you're making some money, financially okay, you're building a reputation, you're doing good work. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think these are um, really important uh, insights. Now maybe let's uh, look a little bit about, uh, you know, towards the higher education system. Um, and you did highlight a little bit on it. You did talk about, um, you know, universities. Um, what kind of um, adaptations or transitions or transformation do you reckon universities need to be going through in India? So, so uh, look, I think first of all, profs have to learn how to teach well online, right? Because they've not been trained for that. They've been trained for classrooms. They're different skills on the video, right? How do you? enthrall an audience that you can't even see. And it's like theater with no audience, remote audience. And this is a film where you don't have retakes. In theater, you don't have retakes. You're live. Right? So when I used to teach, you know, I remember somebody telling me, you know, teaching is like theater. You're giving a live performance each time. And you've got to somehow get through to the audience and the class. And they must walk away enriched by something, some knowledge, something has changed in their heads. They know something they didn't know and that something is useful. If not now, then later, they've learned a new skill, understood a new concept. 
right? So that's the job and role of a teacher. It's but he's never done a video earlier. He's never done a remote audience earlier, right? First is that. Second is look. There is this whole jail theory of school and college that you know you have to go to class. If you don't, so attendance attendance is minimum. So boss, you can't write the exam. So you go to class. Now, if you go to class, then boss, something will filter in. Even if you are not a not an enthusiastic student of that subject or that teacher. Moment is remote. Moment is video. One level of monitoring and tracking is gone. So students have got to be then more of self-starters. Universities have to move fast to adopt this new technology. That won't always happen, right? Uh, so these are the challenges, and you have to remote learn now. And this may go on for a few months. And the truth is, it may never go away fully, in the sense that you will do both. You will teach in class also. You will have remote classes also. Now at Ashoka, we've launched Ashoka X. We're launching Ashoka X, which is courses online, open to general public. Right, and we see that as being there forever. So, वहाँ पे opportunity भी है, अभी challenge भी है फिलहाल. The 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 point, however, is that the costs of a university don't go down by that much. When you switch to remote and online, because the big costs are faculty salaries, management salaries, they stay. What you do cut is you know cost running hostel, cost running the mess, but that's not that much. Which means the cost of the education does not go down that much. But it is now remote. Now, can you create a remote experience that adds as much value, if not, or perhaps even more value in some cases, as opposed to a In person, in class, it's also true that look a lot in a residential campus, in a residential education, a lot of your learning is outside class, interaction with your classmates, study groups, at the you know at till two a.m. discussing a concept, preparing for a class for the class together. Now, unfortunately, that piece will be very hard to replicate in a remote. Technology. So I always say that seventy percent of my learning at IIM Andhra was outside the classroom, or maybe fifty percent. That's hard to replicate, but we have to live with that limitation until it it comes back. Sure. I agree. I think it has uh, thrown up very interesting challenges for schools, universities, higher education institutions. You know, right from March onwards, I think very interesting challenges. Um, you know, some universities uh, have been able to, um, you know. Do an effective job uh, in this regard, especially the online learning piece. This whole idea of moving, um, you know, from a very very um, you know, synchronous learning system to something that you know students have at times wanted. You know, the students have talked about the fact that why do I have to do a lecture at nine thirty in the morning when I can, I want to study that same subject at about ten in the evening instead. So I think a lot of those very why do they be both? Because the lecture will be live at nine thirty and it will be recorded forever. Absolutely, absolutely. So the truth is, you can't ask the prof questions and get answers unless you attend the live section. I agree. I agree. I think uh, it requires far more engagement on both sides. Yes. Yeah. And That's some true. new skills. And new skills. And yeah. a newfound motivation among students. Yes. To be yes. engaged even when you're not in the class. Absolutely. So, do you think um, um, uh, you know Indian universities um, are are ready um, to cope with something like this? This transition. I think some are. Uh, Some are still learning, mm -hmm. uh, but I think in three to six months, everybody will be. Everybody, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be important, absolutely. So, um, if we look at um, this whole idea of um, uh, the workplace that you expect going forward, we have briefly talked about it, but uh, with this whole concept of physical distancing, social distancing. Um, one, of course, the case of um, you know your offices across uh, India. Um, will office functions vary? Will it change even after these three six months that we're hoping things will recover better? Well, look, if COVID is controlled, there's a medicine, there's herd immunity. Uh, you know, it's okay. There's a protocol, and it works in 99% of the cases or 99.9% of the cases. 
uh, and there's a vaccine found and there's a cure found, uh, it'll be like malaria. You know, it'll be like, you know, yeah, so, you know, four lakh people die of malaria every year in India. The truth is there's a cure. So if you get diagnosed early, blood test early, right? Uh, so I have actually never known a single person in my life who I knew personally who died of malaria, but four lakh people die every year in India. Or is that TB? I forget. Uh, but uh, see, TB, malaria, is, is kill a large number of people, but they have known cures. So you will factor that into your risk calculus, right? The problem with COVID right now, it's a lottery. It's a roll of the dice. You know that, you know, out of hundred cases that are diagnosed, and there are many more undiagnosed, maybe three people will pass away. Now, you do know older people with comorbidity have a higher risk, but there are enough instances of younger people also with no known com comorbidities also getting into very serious trouble. I know three or four personally. Right? And that makes it hard to predict and hard to control. And then you say, hey, it could be me. And if there's that fear psychosis, it becomes hard for people to be wanting to come back to work without social distancing. Sure. So to a large extent, I think we are depending on the healthcare professionals, the doctors and research scientists to deliver something, the pharma companies right. to deliver something. Uh, and if they do, uh, then things will go back to as they were. So do you have any advice for some, um, you know, students uh, who, uh, and even the parents, for example, who've been thinking about, uh, you know, maybe putting back um, or maybe waiting one more year to take a decision on further education or, you know, uh, you know trying to hold back a decision, um, so, which will obviously affect the rest of the 40, 40 years of your, their lives or 40, 45 so, so years. So look, I'll tell you, see, it's, uh, I, I do understand that enough people say, why don't I take a gap year? Because I want to be on a physical campus. But the truth is a gap year can extend to five years, 10 years, because if you get out of the habit of studying, will you come back? Right? Uh, if you get out of the habit of studying, will you be able to clear the entrance exam again? So there are pros and cons. Naturally, you know, I myself worked before doing my MBA, uh, but I know that I had to do a lot of self-study to clear that entrance exam the second time. So if you're not going to be able to do that, right? And what if one year becomes two years? So there are pros and cons. And message I'd give is, look, uh, think it through and then decide for yourself. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule either way. Sure. But if you are taking a gap year or a gap two years, make them count. I think the more important thing, make them count. Do something useful, acquire a skill, acquire some knowledge, get some work experience, even if it's not for a salary, but add value to yourself. True, sure. yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do maybe now is uh, take a few questions from the uh, participants today. Um, one uh, question from Simple Just wrote here, uh, it's, uh, you know, very interesting. Uh, who's your role model? Uh, Sanjeev. So look, I uh, I don't have any one role model. Okay, but I have through life learned different things from different people. Right. Uh, very often they were my immediate bosses or my super bosses. So I was very fortunate in my first job in Lintas. I was straight out of college. I was twenty one years old. Uh, and I had, you know, so I had gotten to IM twice, you know, I got once when I, after college, when I didn't go. And once after working for three years when I did go, right. So in those three years, I took up a job at Lintas, the advertising agency. And uh, it's a multinational, got great clients. So, you know, there were some very smart and talented people there. So I was very fortunate that I was a trainee under many of these people. So I simply learned by... A, doing what I'm told to do. B, you know, being taught by them. C, by observing them. Right? 
whether it was strategy, whether it was sheer persistence and trying hard, whether it was uh, people skills, right? Uh, and I think I got that in those first three years. And I have several people I learned there. Then you learn right through your life. You learn from other companies, you learn from people you never met. Some people just inspire you, even if you don't learn anything specific. True. So, I mean, so, uh, so, 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 so today, for example, our company, if I'm being immodest, uh, has built a reputation for very good governance. Right? Uh, and somewhere that ideal was set when I used to read about the Tata's model for governance and giving back to society. Some or Infosys. So you are inspired by organizations that are better than you uh, or have a better reputation than you. You read about them. I've never met them. But you read about it. Or for example, uh, our benchmarks in engineering and technology right, have never been an Indian company. Has never been a job site anywhere in the world. It has been a Google and Amazon and Apple. Now, we may never get there. But we know the gold standard is that. And therefore, we continuously improve, continuously invest. And we, you know, I would say we are very, very sound in technology and engineering right now. And we've got there because there was a higher ideal where we did. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you. So, so, so to answer your question, different role models, different inspirations, different ideals uh, along the way for different things. Perfect. Perfect. So, you, get the, you, so you, pick, you pick the best from 100 different people. Yeah, yeah, great. So we have another question um, which uh, from uh, Miss uh, Jagya. She says, um, do you, to what extent do you think the education systems are in India reforming to cater to the present scenario? Uh, you may have an I, answer. I, I, th I think, I think uh, faster than they were in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. and maybe even 90s. Uh, and it's not just a private sector I'm talking about. I mean, there's some very interesting initiatives in the private sector. Ashoka is one, BM and Mundal is another, Shiv Nadar is another. There are so many good private industries coming up. But more importantly, I see the government system transforming. So you have the IM bill, which is given substantial autonomy to the IMs, badly needed. Right? You see investments going back into the IIDs. You see alumni giving back. Just yesterday, we launched the IM Amdavad Endowment Fund, where alumni are giving back and helping the institute transform. So I see, uh, you know, I, I see a, a fair bit of change. Uh, could it have been 20 years earlier? It could have been 20 years earlier. But it's okay, it's happening now. Better late than never. And hopefully it'll be all right. I think that's very, very encouraging. And, and you're right, I think the circumstances have had, uh, you know, created a scenario where you had to change. There's not a way out of this. And I would imagine change for the better. Yes. So uh, anonymous question, um, uh, which, which is, talks about you know this whole idea of uh, joining university during this uncertain time. Something that I, I did allude to towards the end of our conversation, and paying um, you know. So I guess you know sometimes um, um, you know decision makers, uh, parents, maybe the students themselves, have this thought that online classes you know it, you know should we be paying that amount of money for online classes during this transition phase. Of course, in a few months' time, you will obviously re, you know, revert to the face-to-face -face, uh, when things go right. But is it kind of, um, does it make sense right now? Uh, because so the average... Like face -face uh, if if sorry. Yeah. either the costs go down, which means for costs to go down, faculty are paid less. Why should faculty be paid less? He spend the same amount of time. He has to live also. And it's not as if faculty are paid wild salaries in India. Right? It's not like the corporate sector. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, could universities say I had a 50% class, now it's online and remote, can I make it a 300% class? And therefore, bring down the fees per person, but collect the same number of amount of fees, but will the experience be the same? These are, these are difficult questions. The truth is, we are answering them on the fly. We are learning by doing, we are flying by the seat of our pants, and we are hoping it works out all right in the end. So I can't give a definite answer to that question. But if the costs are not going down, right, and you want the fees to go down, where will the deficit be funded from? 
that's a question to be answered. True. I think very relevant, very relevant, um, very important questions. Uh, so uh, one more question. Having said that, I recognize the, the pain of the students uh, and the parents, but sir, there are no easy answers to this. There's one more question. Um, Raj asks, um, you know, of course, um, you know, he's thankful to you for being very candid um, about your, you know, insights and whatever reflections. Uh, he also asks, is this an opportunity for higher, higher education to overcome some of the weaknesses which we kind of maybe uh, delaying to overcome? Uh, and what could be these weaknesses? So, look, uh, I'm pretty sure there are several weaknesses, right, in several places. The question really is, uh, will this help us overcome all the weaknesses or only in some areas? Now I do know that, look, we were wedded to a model of classroom teaching in class. Suddenly we have been forced to teach remote, we are learning new skills and we're learning how to make remote work. Now, if we are able to make remote work well, suddenly universalization of higher education can become real. So now this has coincided with, you know, or preceded by, you know, telecom networks improving, data improving. Um, and we must thank, uh, you know, Reliance Geo for some of this, right? Uh, that's made it possible to access classrooms remote at a reasonable price, right? Uh, but will all the weaknesses be overcome? Not all the will not be overcome. But I think we have, in many cases, transitioned and gotten out of a mindset that the best teaching can only happen in class. Yes, the best teaching can happen in class, but some of it can also happen remote. And that should enable us to reach many, many more people. And not just in India, around the world. So at Ashoka, we will launch courses, Ashoka X, registration has begun, and a fair number of registrations are coming from outside India. Sure. So you can reach a global audience as a teacher. I agree. I think the scale, you're right, the scale now, you know, uh, is very different. Potentially, potentially is different. Potentially, absolutely. So there's a comment by Utsa who says, are only IT engineers working during this lockdown period? <laughs> well, so, so that's not true. I mean, take a look at our company. Yeah. Uh, so we saw it coming early. We've been tracking COVID ever since those Wuhan videos surfaced uh, right. in January. Uh, and we said, oh my God, now, at that time, in general, nobody ever thought of it, but we began to track it. And we had plans in place two weeks before lockdown on how to switch to work from home. We shut our office one week before the lockdown on our own, all our offices. I said, we are moving to work from home from tomorrow. And we managed a seamless transition. And it's not just IT guys, it's the ops guys, the data guys, the telesales people, the call center. Uh, and the sales guys are now selling on the phone. Right. Earlier they were doing face-to-face calls. Uh, you know, and we, we've got enough technology in the company to do. So today we've not reopened our office, even though we can, because we want to be safe. We don't want a single situation in our office where we took a chance, right? Because business ex exigency demanded it. And in the process, uh, somebody fell ill. We believe we owe it to our employees. We've not cut any salaries. We've not sacked any people. We have. We are honoring every job offer we have made, uh, lat both to laterals and at the entry level on campuses. We are. There are hundred engineers joining. Next couple of months, from campuses, we are not put on a single offer. That's very commendable, actually. I think that's uh, very good. I think the the principles on which um, you know you're built uh, as an organization. Very commend. So there's one more question. I guess this is more. Um, Manvi asks. Um, the the root question is obviously. Um, you know, Manvi is confused about MBA. What specializations within the MBA? Different courses that have come about in the last few years. 
and and she mentions that you know she also is doing a course on happiness. So her basic question is, you know, from your perspective, how how does um, uh, someone bring out clarity in their thoughts? So look, I uh, I'm slightly contrarian here, right? Uh, I never specialized at IMA. So so you know uh, there are many business schools where you have to choose a specialization. Uh, at IMA you don't. In fact, IMA does not offer specializations. You can claim yourself to be a finance guy or a marketing guy by enumerating the courses and say, I've done eight finance courses, I'm a finance guy. But the institute does not offer you a specialization. The institute will not want to certify he's a finance guy, he's a finance MBA. No, he's a, he's a PGDM. Right? And I was very clear that I want to be an entrepreneur. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, I figured that you, I will have to have a bit of everything. So you need 360 degree skills. The truth also is that as, as a job, as a manager, you have to first be a general manager and then specialize. Which means you have to have all round skills, which means OB may be course low, HR may be low, quant may be low, computers may be low, marketing may be low, finance may be low, some may be low. Now, if the institute requires you to specialize, then you figure out, depending on your strengths and your interests in your job goals, your career goals, which specialization you take. So, three four parameters are opportunities. Where are What are you good at? So, what are you good at? What are you interested in? Where are the opportunities? Then, what are the options? And then figure out. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but I would say be very good at something where you can say, this is one of the best in this institute and the best in the world at something, one thing, any one thing. Absolutely. I think we so some good. deep domain expertise in something. Right. And that something should have a market mm -hmm. and you should be interested in it. Great. So Pallavi asks, um, um, if skilled labor and professionals, uh, obviously who are coming back to India from different parts of the world, um, would this be a competition? Would this be a tough competition for who already exists in India? Uh, it certainly will not be a tough competition for people who are just graduating from universities because you guys are freshers. Right? Second, it's not as if a tremendously large number of people have come back just yet. Right? Gulf say I have thought about, US is thought about RA, but it's not a flood yet. And if economies open up, COVID is licked, you know, uh, maybe there won't be a flood. Fair number coming back, but it's not a flood yet. And I think that also I was talking to I was talking to somebody who uh, knows this stuff in the Middle East. He said, "Lakhbag four se six lakh log ne register kiya hai ki hum wapas aana chahte hain." But abhi tak chances are wapas aaye hain. That's percent. Sure. This is about as of uh, one week ago. I think it also brings into question what you mentioned earlier. You know, be good at something. Um, so, generalist foundation, deep domain expertise in one thing, maybe two things, but narrow, deep domain expertise in something. Right. So. There's one question by Varinder, um, and, and she says, do you think the refinements that are happening in professionals due to the present scenario, uh, would they persist or would they perish when we go back to the old days? they will persist. we'll go back to the old days. But yes, until the economy is back, the opportunities will not be abundant till then. And that may take a year or two. Right. Okay. So there's one question by uh, Mr. Jen and uh, he asks, you know, what will be the kind of investments that university should be doing um, in terms of infrastructure development? I think technology. I think uh, technology in the classroom. I think technology in TV studios. I think training of faculty right. uh, to be able to teach on, to the camera. I think uh, investments in restructuring courses and pedagogy so that they are engaging when the prof is sitting 500 miles away. Mm -hmm. 
some reimagination. So this is a, um, a related question, and I guess this is something that um, is is there in um, you know students' minds, you know that if they go for certain online uh, skill building courses at the moment, so you have a, a plethora of these courses that are available, would the industry accept um, them as being very similar to what they may have learned in formal education, let's say in colleges? So I don't know. The most honest answer is I don't know, right? But all I'm saying is that even if they don't accept it, but you you have built a good skill, get into a job somehow, even with no salary. Offer your services free, remote, and become good at what you're doing. Right? And as you work, as you deliver, the same people who are using you free will offer you paid jobs, or some other organization will. Sure. So this is a time actually that you may have expected to join a good salary job somewhere, but maybe now you have to be an apprentice for a while. But, but be gainfully employed right. or gainfully learning or gainfully studying. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and, and something which obviously is very relevant in a country like India, uh, which has uh, variability across uh, the regions uh, in terms of education, especially school education. Um, what do you think about the future of school education, especially in the village areas uh, within the current context? This is a question. Well, I'm having you. some very good reports on technology platforms uh, where people have made it accessible to students, often free of cost. Right. And the adoption is fairly, fairly uh, encouraging because with uh, data access everywhere on the mobile phone uh, and you no know, kids, no matter where they are from, can become digital savvy in three days, even if you've not seen a mobile phone earlier. Right? And I'm getting some good reports. It's not, it's not fully penetrated. It's not universal, but I think we can get there. Okay. So, um, thank you. Uh, there's one question which I guess, um, uh, in a way, three people have asked a similar question. Uh, is about what kind of careers or what kind of roles uh, do you think will gain prominence post-COVID? Uh, look, if it's post-COVID, if COVID's gone away, it'll be roughly the same roles as earlier. The industry has not undergone a total transformation and will not. Right? But if it is, COVID is lingering. COVID has transformed the way you work. The next three years or four years, there will be a different set of skills and jobs, right? In some cases. So the methods, of, so the functions and targets and objectives will remain the same of organizations. The way you work may be different. You may not make field sales calls if COVID persists. So as a salesperson, you will have to learn to close sales remote. You will have to over the video, over the phone, it's a new skill. But you will also be able to make, make, more, make more sales calls. Because if earlier in physical meetings during four a day, can you do eight now? Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, it was a lot about, uh, as a manager, you have to supervise your people remote. You, this management by walking about MBWA, which is this big thing, right? That you walk up to somebody, you know, you have a coffee with him, you know, you chit chat, there's chemistry, there's bonding, there's rapport. Right? Uh, how do you do that remote? How do you ensure that your team is productive when they're not in the same physical space, the working hours? How do you ensure that, uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, in case work from home is universal, for the next five years, hypothetically. And somebody asks, hey, what's your organization culture like? I, say, I don't know culture. I've not been in the last five years. Now that won't happen. How on earth, how on earth will you induct a trainee? How on earth will you learn a training program remote? A guy's first year of a job, how will you supervise him? You will have to teach him. How do you teach him? You are a trainee in a company, 
you just joined. How will you learn? Those are unanswered questions. Like I said, we're flying on the feet of our minds. True, true. I would imagine the um, the role of exponential technologies will only get uh, faster or quicker. It will, it will, but still, ultimately, you know, human beings are social animals. Mm -hmm. You need to meet people. You need to talk. You need to bash slap. You need to shake hands. Uh, you need to do chemistry bonding. Yeah, I guess team spirit is something that you can't uh, maybe create. Human touch. Human touch cannot be replaced. True, true, true. On a sustainable basis. Absolutely. So I think we have just one or two more questions and obviously we are running out of time. I think it's been an amazing uh, uh, session and engagement. So uh, there's one um, generic question which talks about um, uh, on what basis one must opt for a college or university. So uh, Jashan asked this question, maybe very quickly if you can talk about some parameters. So the way I look at it, first of all, uh, you know, uh, obviously, if you look at the top of the heap, the brand names are known. And if you want to, if you get in there and it's consistent with your career goals and what you want to study and learn and what you want to do afterwards, join that. The real decision problem comes when you're dealing with imperfect information. Right? I'm now down the rankings. I don't know if this one is better than that one. Right? I would say talk to people. I would say figure out what the alumni are doing. Ask them what happened there. Use your networks. You've got LinkedIn, you've got Facebook. Find, find people, talk to them right. Right? and make sure it aligns with your capabilities, interests and goals. Three things, capabilities, interests and goals. Absolutely. Capabilities, interests and goals. Yeah, great. Now there's one question by Mr. Dasgupta and he asks, what are the medium and long-term consequences of the pandemic in terms of corporate and emerging sectors? So there's, there's always this conversation about hospitality taking some time, aviation taking time, but the other sectors which are going to emerge. So maybe what are the medium and long-term consequences? So look, uh, like I said, it depends whether COVID is a long-term problem or COVID is a three to six month problem, mm -hmm. right? So let's say India acquires or big Indian cities acquire herd immunity by November. Workplaces will be back to normal by Jan, right? Employment markets may take a little longer and certainly employment freshers may take a little longer. We hope people start hiring because GDP and turnovers and sales will take a little longer, right? Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you know you are telling me that you know social distancing has to be done for the next five to ten years, okay, then many things will change. Okay, and you got to go vertical by vertical, industry by industry, job by job, function by function, and say, okay, how will things change? And certainly, technology will have a big role to play in it. Right? We are doing this call on Zoom right now. And I'll ask you a question. Before Jan, how many times did you use Zoom? Zoom? Avishal, tell me. Very seldom. Same here. I'd heard of it. I'd used it once or twice because somebody had sent me a link. Now I'm doing five Zoom calls a day. Now I know all the features. I'm, very prof I'm getting more proficient at it. I used to, feel, you know, I used to just say no to video conferences. I feel awkward in front of camera. So somebody asked me how to speak. I couldn't speak. I do a video conference. I would find an excuse. <laughs> so six months ago, if you'd asked me for this, I would have said, yeah, you know, Vishal, I'm busy. You know, I, you know, I've got investor meetings. And now Zoom is valued at, um, you know, more than the top four airlines in the world. You know, yeah. Amazing. How so I tell you, you know, uh, so Reliance was planning its, uh, its Reliance has been in the works. Reliance Geo has been in the works for 10 years before it launched. Right. And I remember, uh, maybe 15 years ago, 12 years ago, the engineers visited our office as we are a heavy consumer of bandwidth, you know, we are an internet company and they sat and talked to us. And I remember asking this guy, so who do you view as a competition? He said the airlines. And I said, why? He says, uh, because once we launch, we expect uh, video conferencing to eliminate the need to travel for meetings. And I laughed at him. And I said, that's a real sign of fancy. But this pandemic has done it. True, true. I think uh, absolutely. You know, 
within no time, things have changed so much. So thank you. I think we kind of um, uh, done with the question. Maybe, um, uh, you know, there's one more. Yes, there is one more. Um, so somebody asks, um, obviously, and, and this is in the context of, um, uh, let's say, the, uh, uh, you know, the MBA or management uh, qualifications. If somebody obviously is not able to do very, very well in the um, competitive examination, for example, CAT, um, uh, you know, does it then make sense um, to be able to keep trying or does it make sense to be able to join a place which uh, definitely, um, uh, you know, it will help him and help him or her in the career? Look, I mean, it, like I said, uh, what are your goals, right? And will that course of study at that institute add value to you and move you further towards the goal? And the answer is different for different people, for different goals, and for different institutions and different courses. So it has to be situation specific, right? There's no general answers here. But it's, I think, a little useful to maybe work for a year or two and then come back into the market uh, to, to try again for, for, for an MBA from wherever. Even if you can't get a cat, it doesn't matter. Because if you get work in a good organization, you actually get more juice out of your MBA. And I learned that by working for three years and then doing my MBA. Because what's taught in the class, you can relate to far better because you've actually worked. For the others who haven't worked, what has been taught in MBA class is theory. Yeah, you're right. I think it also, um, you know, brings in the um, the essence of uh, the institution that you would like to join. So if an yes. institution is able to give you, um, you know, the right level of involvement, learning by doing, uh, build in a lot of... Yeah, this is not a comment on any specific institution. All I'm saying is, look, if you haven't gotten a place you want to get into, yeah, you know, you can try for others, choose wisely, choose well. Also consider working for two, three years and then doing an MBA. Right. In an institution where maybe 80% have come straight from college. Right, right. You will, you will, you will set yourself apart. Sure, sure. Great. So um, I think thank you very much. Uh, we've kind of uh, addressed a lot of the questions. Yes, there's one more baby which uh, talks about what is hurting more, um, or what is uh, what what is uh, causing more transition at the moment. Is it Industry 4.0 or is it COVID? I would say it's a lockdown, and it in in, in descending order. Number one, lockdown. Number two, uh, you know, uh, fear of COVID. Number three, COVID. Right. right? Uh, now, as far as industry 4.0 is concerned, the transition in India will be slower than people think. So right. That's for a sudden transition. That will give you enough time to adapt and change. The problem is sudden, sudden adaptation to a surgical change. To drastic change, sudden change. Right. True. No, absolutely. I think lockdown, fear yeah, of. Somebody had told us, you know what, over the next three years, there's a government law to reduce pollution and traffic in cities. Over three years, transition to 25% of the workforce working from home. That's one pace of change. Now it is, next one week, I want 100% working from home. They're different situations. True, true. Great. Thank you very much. I think it's, an, uh, it's been a very engaging, um, uh, very, very uh, reflective session. I really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us. I'm sure the audience um, and all the participants uh, would have really appreciated your clarity of thought and your insight. Absolutely amazing. And something that I'm, I'm taking away from the, here is that hang in there. This whole idea of... Yeah, you've got to hang in there. You've got to hang in there. So I'll end with this thing, right? Uh, I quit my job in 1990. In the next 10 years, I did 100 small things. Not talking 97, but for in the next 10 years, for those, out of those 10 years, for six years, I could not take a salary. From 1990 to 93, and from 97 to 2000, I could not take a salary. Okay? But we hung on in there. Now, we got our first real big break when we raised venture capital in April 2000, we had capital finally after 10 years of study. Okay. I could have quit anytime before that. And I would have been a failed entrepreneur. Right? 
2000 we risked money and there was an immediate meltdown. Dot com bubble burst, 9 11 happened. So, four more years of struggles. So, Chota Sal. Chota Sal ka struggle tha. We hung on in there. And that's why we are where we are. So, hang on in there. Commendable. Yes. Share then, Ainge, hang on in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure and a lot of um, you know, thank you and appreciation is pouring in uh, into the chat box. Uh, people are finding the session very informative, very motivational and um, you know, excellent. Some people are actually mentioning that. So thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, Sanjeev. Thank you, thank you so much. More sessions with you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.